Good evening. Good to see you tonight. Let's turn to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to take a break from Revelation, of course. You guys enjoying Pastor Jeff and Revelation? I'm telling you what. Talk about some solid teaching in that book, man. That's incredible. Awesome stuff. But the 2 Timothy, that's what we're going through in the men's ministry. So if you're in the men's ministry, you're going to get a little taste of what we had the other night, but also a little preview of what's coming up. But here in our pastor, we're being chapter 3, by the way. And how many of you are reading through the Bible? Let me see the hands of all you that are reading through the Bible. With the reading program or just on your own? One year, one year. That's awesome. The rest of you guys, I just got to tell you, you're missing out. You need to get in the book. If you don't have a Bible with you tonight, there's one in front of you, so pick it up and open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Tonight, the title, Know This, The Man to Reject, The Man to Follow. In our passage here, this chapter, we're going to go through the whole chapter tonight, so we've got a lot to cover, but uh, Paul is warning Timothy about the false teachers, about what is to come. He says, but know this, in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be, he goes through a list of 18 unholy, ungodly characteristics. But Paul speaks of two types of men here in our, in our chapter, the man to reject, and then verse 10 through 17, the man to follow. And the man to reject is the false teachers of the day, um, men in general. And the man to follow, Paul was speaking of himself. And he describes these false teachers, the one who had crept into the church, and he makes it clear that you've got to turn away from these, Tim. Um, and the characteristics of the man that we reject is the flesh. So you can see a picture of the flesh here, a picture of the spirit. Those are the works of the flesh, the works of the spirit. Walking in the spirit. And of course, in the last days, as we see here, we must know, we must be on guard. Why? Because he says, men will become, but also, verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And of course, that was taking place then, and it's taking place now. It's interesting you read this. It's, it's like you're reading the headlines of today, and yet... Uh, what, about 1950 years ago this was written? We see how relevant it is for us today, these last days. And deception is a true sign of the last days. Jesus spoke about it. Matthew 24, disciples came to him and said, hey, what will be the signs of your coming? First thing out of his mouth, what did he say? See to it that you're not deceived. Why? Because men will come claiming that they are me, that they're prophets that I've sent and such. He tells his disciples, turn away. And deception, of course, is making someone believe something that is not true. And this is definitely a tactic of the devil. Started where? In the garden with Eve. Totally deceived her. And, of course, Adam was a part of that as well. And it's something that's increasing. It's something that we all experience. We need to keep our eyes on, of course, and we need to be on guard. Jesus said, see to it that no one deceives you. How do we do that? How does that happen? How do we see to it that no one deceives us? And the worst form of deception is when you think that you're okay, and yet you're actually heading for disaster. And it kind of goes like this. You know, I don't have an anger problem. I just, just like to hit people. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a pride problem. It's all of you have the problem. It's not me. I don't, I don't have a lust problem. I just like looking at women or men, right? I don't have a, I don't have a lust problem. Come on. I'm, I'm not hooked on prescription drugs, pain meds, antidepressants. I get them from my doctor. Uh, it's kind of funny, but it's not funny. These are the types of way that the enemy deceives us, thinking that we're okay. I don't, I don't have a lying problem. I just have a little trouble being honest, and we see this type of deception taking place. The devil's deception is just a bunch of lies. And the key, of course, is that we reject the first man and we follow the second man. And we reject the, the first man that we'll talk about and we follow the second man. It closes the door. It'll help keep the door closed to deception. And ultimately, we're going to end up, verse 16 and 17, with the word of God. This is your weapon. This is your sword. This is the way that we defeat the enemy, the lies that come, the deception that comes. And, of course, the whole world is under this deception. 
those in your family that aren't saved, the problem is they're deceived. They're blinded. The enemy has placed a veil over their eyes. And the only way that that veil is opened is when the truth is brought to them, the truth of God's word. And when we walk in God's word, when we're reading God's word on a daily basis, it corrects us. It gets us back on track. It speaks to our heart. The longer you're out of God's word, the easier it is for the devil to deceive you, to blind you, and you'll end up like that list, that hypothetical list that is actually true. <laughs> I don't have anger. I'm not prideful. I don't got any of these things. I, there's nothing wrong with me. Yes, there is. Everybody else can see it except for you. So verse 1, Paul says, but know this. And it says to be aware, to be constantly aware that last days, and that's the period of time that really started when Jesus ascended until he returns, and we are in the last days. We've been in the last days for quite some time, actually. And yet, when Paul is telling Timothy this, it's last days, but it's present. Verse 5, he says, having the form of God in this, but denying his power, and from such people turn away. He's telling Tim, turn away. It's, it's right there. It's present. But it's also prophetic, speaking of the last days. And how many of us believe that we're in the last days, the very last days? I mean, it's like we are here. Right now for Tim and right now for us in these perilous times that will come, the word is dangerous, fierce, and it's the same word that's used to describe the demoniacs in Gadara that where Christ cast out the demons out of these guys. I mean, they were crazy, fierce, dangerous. And it really speaks of the difficult times and seasons that the church is going to go through and that we ourselves are going to go through. Why? Why? Verse 2, because men will be, and this is what will become of the heart of man, and this is what is in the heart of man, the false teachers and the men in general. And we're going to go through this list. Now, you're going to look at this and go, ah, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. That's, praise God, but remember that every single one of these characteristics is in your heart and in my heart. And the only way it stays in check is by the power of God's Holy Spirit where we crucify our flesh Daily, daily, every single day, every single moment. I mean, you let the old man out of the bag, out of the coffin, so to speak, and you're right there. And there could be some of us tonight that are struggling with a lot of these things that we're going to talk about. The first man, though, we reject. What are these 18 characteristics? This is his heart, number one. We reject his heart. Verse 2 through 4 says, For men will be lovers of themselves, Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The American man, American woman right there. Lovers of themselves, obviously self-centered, selfish. Uh, it's, it's, it's all about me. It's, it's my universe, and I'm the center of it. You run into people like that? Uh, driving, I think you can find that quite a bit. I mean, the people just like, it's just, it's their road. It's their lights. It's their, every, it's, you know, and I'm one of those drivers, by the way, so <laughs> my wife says that all the time. Thank her for that. But lovers of themselves, self-centered, lovers of money. Because I love myself, I got to have money. I need money. It's the answer to all of life's problems. And every single one of us in this room was dreaming about winning that Powerball, Right? Or having a, a family member win it, you know, you weren't actually buying tickets, right? But, you know, I don't think they've determined who's the winner in Chino. I bet it's Pastor Jack out there. <laughs> he just didn't want to come forward, man. <laughs> Someone from his church is right around the corner. It's amazing. Lovers of money. Boasters. Look at what I got. This is what Cam Newton wished he could be right now. <laughs> Few you Super Bowl sports folks out there. Look at what I got, proud. Look at what I did, blasphemers. This is revilers, abusive people, scoffing at God, kind of fighters in a sense. Disobedient to parents, uh, really rebellion as unto God in that, that respect. Unthankful, really just plain mad at life. You ever meet people like that? Just they ain't thankful for nothing. You give them an in and out, and they're, ah, it's, it's got onions on it, you know. <laughs> Unthankful, unholy, vile, repulsive, unloving, callous, 
hearts that are hard as a rock. We've met people like that. Unloving, unforgiving. That's a bitter-hearted person, and, and we know that unforgiveness, you know, is a prison. It's a prison cell for you. Slanders. It's just another name for a politician right there. Slanders. <laughs> I mean, isn't it a joke when you see these debates going on? There's a grown men. These are grown men. Without self-control, speaking of lustful indulgence, brutal, extreme acts of violence. We see that taking place on the nightly news. Despisers of good, they, they get angry at good people. They're traitors. They're stabbing in the back. They're headstrong, conceited. They want their way. They're haughty, proud of what they become and proud of their reputation. It's just the way that I am. And then lovers of pleasure, of course, hedonism, believing that, that pleasure is or happiness is the most important goal in this life. It might be someone that we think of like a Hugh Hefner type. Just, and you take lovers of pleasure, sandwich that with lovers of themselves, you throw all this in the middle, and there's not a thing that a person won't do to get what they want, especially when you love yourself and you love pleasure. So this is the man. This is his heart. This is what his heart has become. This is what our hearts can become if we're not in the word of God. We reject that man. Number two, we reject his religion. Verse five says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Has a form, no power. And really this speaks about those who, who want to be religious and have religion as a part of their life, but it's not their life. It's just a... Um, Another badge, so to speak, just a part of their life. But they do not allow the religion, so to speak, to affect them. His religion, it caters to his flesh. And a lot of times people, they want to, they want to feel good about themselves. So they'll go to church. They'll do all the things at church. And, you know, I, I feel good because I went to church. I gave. I, I fed the homeless. But it's all about their flesh. Like the Pharisees, number two, it looks good on the outside. It's the form, going through the motions, the traditions of men. And this is the picture of the Pharisees. They're fakes. It was all outward, an all outward pretense. Look at me. Look how good I am. And thirdly, it has no power to change. And this is where they reject the work of the Spirit of God. They're, they're not going to be accountable to the Spirit of God. Nobody's going to tell me how to live my life. It's a religious person. Therefore, there's no change. There's nothing wrong with me. And, of course, Paul is speaking of those in the church, those false teachers who had crept in for their own purposes. And he says, for, and from such people to turn away, to reject these people, have nothing to do with these people, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, Paul told the Ephesian believers. So you're saying to yourself, well, I know a lot of people like that. That's my extended family members. Just a little joke there. But we have family members like that. We know people like that. So I'm supposed to, what am I supposed to do? Just ignore them? No. The important thing is to remember, they're not your friends. You cannot have fellowship with those who do not know the Lord. They become your ministries. Understand that point. You reach out in the name of Jesus. You go after them to be saved. Jesus went to the homes of the sinners. He didn't do the pharisaical thing and cross the other side of the street when the Samaritan was laying on the road. No, nah, that's not Jesus. But for us, though, you, you can't just go, hey, I hope you didn't go over to the Super Bowl party with your friends and sit there and indulge with your friends because they're your friends, but they're not your Christian friends. That would have been the wrong thing to do. We reject his religion. Number three, we reject his motives. Verse 6 and 7, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We reject his motives. Sad truth about false teachers. There's a motive behind it. And, and Peter describes this over in 2 Peter chapter 2. You turn there if you want. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. 
And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. There's a lot of false teachers out there, folks. There's a lot of churches out there preaching things that are not biblical. And the motive behind it is these false teachers looking out for themselves. Verse 12 says, But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak of evil things they don't understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. And this is incredible right here. And they have a heart trained in covetous practices. What is covetousness? I want, I need, I want your money. And in this context as well, I not only don't want your money, but there are false teachers and preachers and people that will come and they will prey on the women that come to their church. Heart trained on covetousness and are accursed children. And they have forsaken the right way, gone astray, falling the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Doing it for money. Paul talked to Timothy about that in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. Those who saw godliness as a means for gain. And all you got to do is turn on the TV, certain channel that has three letters that stand for that channel, and you can see people on that TV who are proclaiming all about Jesus, who are flying around in bazillion dollar jets and homes all over the world and mansions saying that I'm blessed of God and that's why I got all this. Reject that man. Reject that man. But he was rebuked, speaking of Balaam, for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's a long time. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. Women loaded down with sinful sins, led away by various lusts. His motives to take advantage of the unsuspecting, using their religion to gain access, fooling the people. Oh, isn't he such a nice guy? Oh, he's such a good speaker. Oh, he's so pleasant. I love the way he does his hair. I mean, all this trash. False teachers, they target these types. Take advantage of the weaknesses, using the guilt of their sin as a way to get to their money and to their flesh. And it's pure manipulation. And you understand that any form of manipulation is sin. Amen? I didn't say that too convincingly. <laughs> to keep them from the truth, the truth that would set them free, the truth that would expose their motives. And I'm going to throw out a name. You all remember Jim Baker, the late 80s. If you don't know about this guy, Google. You Google, you can find anything. But amazing, this story. So tragic. The guy... They, they invent basically PTL with um, the fall wells and on that channel and basically end up bilking the followers out of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then there's the old scandal with Jessica Hahn, you might remember. And then everything is exposed. The feds come in, so to speak, and just blow the whole thing up. He gets sentenced to 45 years in jail. You know how many years he served? Five. You know why? Because when they appealed it, the judge who sentenced him, they could tell he was a little bit miffed. And he was actually a religious person. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he was a religious person. And he said that what you did was so radically wrong and just threw the book at him. And they, they claimed that he kind of, um, he wasn't unbiased in his sentencing. So they gave him Actually, they gave him eight years and he served five. His motives, we reject. In the verse eight and nine, number four, we reject his sin. Now as Jans and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, disapproved 
concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs was also. Now, Jans and Jambres, these guys aren't named anywhere. We don't even actually know where they came up with these names. But these are the magicians over in Exodus chapter 8 that were matching the miracles of Moses up until number 3. And they couldn't match anymore. It was kind of silly. You read number 3, and it was the plague of lice. And so the magicians there are trying to do the plague of lice. Like, that doesn't make any sense. How about get rid of the lice? They couldn't do either. And the idea is here that the false teachers, they tried to make themselves, and they try to make themselves look like those true men of God, like the apostles, like Paul. But they're not equal, and they're not. And the evidence is that the false eventually is exposed and rejected. So his sin is, number one, he resists the truth. Because the truth won't support unholy motives. And there ain't no money in truth. Only in the lies. His mind is corrupt because the desire for the false has destroyed his ability to receive the truth. And, and sin has infected his mind like a computer virus. And his faith is false. It's not in line with the gospel. It's not truth. And his sin, number four, will be exposed. Uh, the masquerade only lasts so long. And if you go through history and through time, false teachers, even of our day, um, are finally exposed. They're rejected. Again, thinking of Jim Baker, and he's not the only one. They're finally found out. Numbers 32, 23. What does it say? Be sure your sin will find you out. So, this man, the first man to reject his heart, his religion, his motives, his sin. Now on to the good stuff. Got that out of the way. Amen? Now, verse 10 through 17, the man to follow. And here, in reality, Paul is giving testimony of his life. And he says, Tim, but you have carefully followed what? He's saying, Tim, you know about my life. Tim, you've been with me through it all. You have followed my life. Remember, Tim was Paul's protege, son in the faith, beloved son in the faith. Got saved. Paul saw him, grabbed him, and knew that this guy had a heart after God. In essence, what Paul is saying is that Tim, in these last days, because men will be, what verse 2 through 4 says, and that evil men and apostles will grow worse and worse. He says, hey, Tim, follow this example. Follow my example. Follow what you've seen in me. And the key, though, is verse 14. He says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of and knowing. And that is the key, guys. That's the challenge for us. Got to continue. The things you've learned from me. So number one, the man to follow, his example. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Encouraging Tim right there with, hey, Tim, yeah, <laughs> you know what I went through. But you saw what God did. And you saw how God brought me through. He'll bring you through it. He'll bring me through it. He'll bring you through it here tonight. And Paul told the Corinthian believers also, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He told the Philippian believers, brethren, join and follow my example and note those who so walk as you have a pattern. You have us as a pattern. And we need to be following these types of men and these types of women in our lives as well. People that you know, people that you have seen their lives, that you recognize that God's hand upon, is upon them. You need to re, be rejecting the ones you've been following that have, that have been taking you down and start following ones that are raising you up, that will encourage you, that will build you up, that are following Jesus, that are, that are challenging you, that are telling you, hey, you're out of line. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be acting that way. You shouldn't be treating your kids that way. You shouldn't be treating your wife that way. I don't want to listen to you. I want to go listen to the guy that will make me feel good about myself. No. Follow godly people. Men and women who can say like Paul, I am finishing the race. I am keeping the faith. I am fighting the good fight. Those are the type of men and women, teenagers, if you're here. I don't know if you're here. I don't think there's anybody in here under 25. Huh? 
Maybe you are. Close. But we need to be following these types of men. So Tim, follow and continue, number one, in my doctrine. What he taught, and of course, he's speaking of the gospel. Now, there's much more that Paul taught in regards to the doctrines that are in the Bible. And Romans is just full of it, justification, sanctification, all these things we, we know there to be true. But the main thing was the main thing with the Apostle Paul, and the main thing stayed the main thing, and the main thing was the gospel. And you know why Billy Graham has been and was so successful in his ministry? Because he preached what? The gospel. I mean, go back and listen. I mean, it's like, you know, Greg Laurie, he's just preaching the gospel. All the messages that are basically the same. They're the gospel messages. Follow the doctrine. Follow my manner of life, his walk or his conduct. Paul told the Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, you are witnesses and God also. Wouldn't it be good to be able to say, call God as your witness? You're going to go to trial for being a Christian. I'm calling God as my witness. Yeah, I don't know about that one. I might call Pastor Tuvai or Pastor Pat, but I don't know about God. But you are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Can you say that tonight? That manner of life. Paul was, he was so careful about his witness, so careful about what people saw, didn't want to offend. He wouldn't even take money. He'd worked. Tent maker. No, no, he, he had the right. He's, he, he knows he could have taken money. No. Manner of life, purpose, the reason that Paul was alive. Now I'm going to make you turn to Acts 26. You've got to see this. Turn with me to Acts 26. You may or may not know, but this is Paul's testimony. He shares it three times in the book of Acts. But here's one of the best ones. He's there before um, Agrippa. Acts 26, verse 16, basically. And he's telling the story about him being on the road to Damascus. Now, this is where Paul receives his purpose in life. Have you received your purpose for your life? Why did God save you? Why did God pull you out of that horrible pit you were in? Do you know that? Do you know the reason? This is the ultimate come to Jesus meeting right here. We know that Paul's knocked off his horse. And here, verse 16, Jesus speaking, but rise and stand on your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And here it is, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. Bam. Paul's purpose in life. And he never wavered. He never turned from that. And would to God that we would all receive um, that kind of a revelation from Jesus for our lives. Now, not everyone is supposed to be a pastor, preacher, um, but we all are supposed to shine our lights, amen? None are, are void of that or free from that. Find out what your purpose is. Find it out, this testimony. Then he says, follow my faith. And this is, speaks of faithfulness or trustworthiness, the idea of of. Faithfully living and being a trustworthy person. Is that you? Is that me tonight? Long-suffering, same word for patience or steadfastness. And it speaks of a resolute and persistent spirit in the servant of Christ who never gives up or gives in, especially dealing with difficult people. Anybody deal with difficult people? I'm not talking about your wives, your husband. I'm talking about maybe you know, those other people. <laughs> dealing with difficult people is life. Long-suffering. And then he says, my love, this word agape, unconditional love. See, and Paul had experienced this type of love from Jesus, amen? I mean, here was Paul. Paul was not good before he came to Christ. He was persecuting the church. That's why Jesus says, Paul, what are you, what are you doing? You're persecuting me. You think you're doing what God's work, but you're wrong. And we know Paul's history. We know his testimony of, of dragging Christians into jail and, and taking them to have them be killed and such. 
So he experiences this love, and he demonstrates this love to others. This is agape. Now, phileo love, we got a lot of phileo love around here. Brother love, right? How about agape love? Agape, unconditional, not expecting anything in return for what you do for others. Loving them unconditionally as Christ has loved us. Perseverance, endurance, cheerful or hopeful endurance in dealing with difficult circumstances. And really, basically, he says, Tim, follow my example. You've seen how I've handled these, how I responded to the persecutions and the afflictions now. Verse 11, the persecutions, the afflictions, which, I, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And, and the story of all of these is in Acts 13 and 14. And these persecutions were the attacks from the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and you read through the book of Acts, and it's just an incredible story of the Apostle Paul. And it seemed like every time he'd go in a synagogue, he'd come out and he'd get beat up. It'd be like us going outside the church, and there's people there waiting to punch you in the nose. And in Acts 13 and 14, you can turn there if you'd like, but I'm turning over there. Just to see a little bit of this, this story here. Got plenty of time. And, of course, in, in Acts 13, he's there in Antioch, and then, then he moves from there, and he heads over to Iconium in and, and chapter 14. But, but even in this, this chapter 13, the Jews stirred up devout and prominent women and chief men in the city and raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region, flat kicked them out. So Paul's with Barnabas, and he's going where the Lord's supposed to tell him to go. He's in God's perfect will, really. Chapter 14, he gets Iconium there, and he's doing stuff. He's preaching away, and, he, and he, then he leaves there because they're coming. Verse 5 says that when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. That'd kind of be discouraging, huh? You just, you know, we were over in the Philippines, and, I mean, nobody tried to stone us. Nobody tried to abuse us. You know, it, it was easy, actually. I couldn't imagine if that was the case. I'd be thinking, I'm in the wrong place. No, Paul's in a perfect place, God's perfect place. Then he goes over, verse 8, of chapter 14, to Lystra, and he's there. He heals a cripple who'd never walked, healed a guy that had never walked. And the people start worshiping him and Barnabas, and they're like, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. The verse 19, though, this is a killer. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. Check this out. Supposing him to be dead. What does that mean? It's like, I mean, I, we've all, maybe you haven't, but come upon, upon a dead cat, you know, you just kick it. Uh, not, it's not alive. I was like, they must have kicked Paul. Well, yeah, he's not dead. And they walked away. An amazing thing is, oh, look at this. However, when the disciples gathered around him, no doubt they were praying, amen, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas the Derby. And when he had preached the gospel to that city, he gets up. He, imagine what he must have looked like. Stoned to the point where you're knocked cold, out cold, and bloody, beat up. They probably thought, this guy, he's, he's crazy. He preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples and returned to, wait, wait, he says, he returned to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch. He was nuts. He was just nuts. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Back to our passage. Tim, you followed all this. You saw all this. You saw, really what he's saying, you saw how I handled all this. Now follow that example. The Lord delivered him out of them all. And it's interesting, Paul, he, he says, just says, the Lord delivered me. I would have been complaining, I would have been whining, I'd be saying, like, Lord, what's up? What do you mean? What are you doing this to me for? But he doesn't. He encourages Tim. He encourages him. Because if we were like, if we were Paul, I think if I was Paul, then I'd have thrown the towel and said, I'm done with this thing. I've had enough of this. So the man to follow. His example through all these things. Then number two, the man to follow, number two, verse 12, his desire. 
It says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Here Paul is giving Tim a biblical maxim. This is the way it is. This is the Christian life. There's no getting out of it. There's no getting around it. There's no getting away from it. You're going to suffer as a Christian. Anybody say amen to that? Okay, we do. But we don't suffer near like we could. Near like what could be coming our way. Nothing like the Apostle Paul. All you got to do is read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you see what Paul lists of these sufferings that he went through. How many times he was beaten, how many times he was stoned, how many times he was whipped, how many times he was shipwrecked, how many times he was starving. Just wow. And really what Paul is saying to Tim is, Tim, I have desired to live godly, and I have suffered for it. But he says, no matter the consequences, Tim, this is my desire. Is this your desire tonight, to live godly? No matter the consequences, jail or not, imagine that. If if you walk out, Tonight, and there's police waiting for you to take you to jail. You might point them to Tuvai. <laughs> no matter the consequences, no matter what it costs me, my reputation or life. Now, you remember the Apostle Paul lost his reputation as a Pharisee. Philippians chapter 3 talks about that. He basically counted all that he had, and he was the top dog. One of the, he was just like Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, blameless Pharisee. He and his wife probably lived in the nicest places that the Pharisees lived. They had all of the, all the accoutrements, all that stuff there of that lifestyle, of the pharisaical lifestyle. He gives it all up. Lost his reputation or his life. And of course, we know that he's writing this letter to Tim, his final personal letter. And he tells Tim in chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. The time of my departure is at hand. And imagine if you're Tim reading this letter. It's like, oh, God, please no. Please no. Can't be now. And yet his desire, no matter the consequences, no matter what it costs him, no matter how hard it gets. And that's the challenge for us because the spiritual warfare is just constant. It ebbs and flows, it ups and downs, but it's, it's like, You're always in some sort of a trial. Always something going on. Amen? Or am I the only one? Am I the only one getting kicked around and stoned and everything? And yet that's what it's about. That's in this life we're going to suffer. Those who desire to live godly. Constant spiritual warfare. And that's the challenge. When you're in this type of a warfare, this type of a battle, to be able to recognize it, to not be deceived, to not be confused, you got to be following this type of example. His desire, number three, the man to follow, his warning. Verse 13, but evil men and apostles will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Man, is that so true today. Saying, be ready, Tim, it's going to get worse. You think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. And regarding evil men, And the news is full of it every single night. Every single night you see. It's like, you know, I say it before every time I teach. Got to just turn the news off. Yeah, you can't. You know, oh, what's, you know, breaking news. It's breaking news. I like to break the TV news. That's what I like to do. I mean, ISIS, of course, is probably the first thing in mind. You know, evil men, ISIS, horrific crimes against humanity. And you're not hearing much about it, but it's going on. If you follow, um, ACLJ, um, I forgot what that stands for. I always think of ACLJ, but American Center for Law and Justice, they're, they're on top of it, and their emails that come out there from them are just like, oh, my gosh, it's horrible. Evil men, worse. Regarding imposters and false teachers, churches across America, bad doctrines being taught, people being taught lies, being, people being taught things that won't save them. It's only the gospel that's going to save somebody. Well, we need to talk about the gospel because the gospel has the S word in it. We don't want to talk about the S word. You know I'm, the word I'm talking about, right? Sin. See, where were your minds at? You're like the other man, huh? <laughs> Dang. Man to reject. False teachers. You know, on TV they had that uh, Bernie Madoff program. Anybody watch that? 
I'm the only carnal one, huh? <laughs> I, I actually started watching, and I, I, I had to turn it off. It was just, it's like, this guy, oh my gosh. The whole story is horrible. I mean, he's the one, you know, Bernie Madoff, right? Built people out of 50B, not M, B, $50 billion. And um, Richard Dreyfus plays Bernie Madoff. Did a good job, actually, I think. I mean, convinced me that the guy was a creep. And, and he's so sad, though, so sad. Impo- this guy, he, he, was, he was so wrong. Regarding deceived and being deceived, deception, making people believe that something's not true, man, it's a perfect picture of how the devil works, y'all. Perfect picture. To make you to believe a lie and to cause you to sin. That's what it's all about. This, this warning that Paul throws out there. Warning. Warning all of us to be on guard. See, the perilous times in these last days, this deception. So how do you know you're being deceived? You ever ask yourself that question? Am I being deceived right now? Am I? Well, number one, examine yourself. Paul says, examine yourself. David said, Lord, examine me. Examine yourself. Is what you're doing, is it biblical? That's, that's the first thing to determine where you're at with this. So you say to yourself, okay, I'm kind of thinking of, of like having an affair with this guy or this girl where I work. Am I being deceived or, and it's an obvious, ridiculous illustration, but if it's not biblical, it's got to be the deception. Deception goes against biblical truths. Examine yourself. Number two, be accountable to someone. Ask them this question, do you see anything in my life? And you need to have people like this around you that aren't afraid to tell you the truth. Because I'm telling you what, I mean, the devil, he's, anybody stronger than the devil in this room? Do you think you can be deceived? Have you been deceived? Have you bought the lies? Have you found yourself in a place where you shouldn't be? Have you found your mind going from this to this in a nanosecond? It's like, how did it get over here? Man. See, others can have a better view than you have. I mean, is that true or not? I mean, only people who know you have B.O. are the people around you. You don't know it. <laughs> and I'm, just, I'm just saying, am I, is that true or not? I was like... <laughs> Wait a minute here. Is he, did he walk by me or something? Is he, be accountable to someone and ask the Holy Spirit. Sit before him. Lord, hear him speak. But this takes a humble and contrite heart that is honestly ready for truth. You don't want to sit before him and, and be like the, the tax collector. <laughs> Lord, I'm glad I'm not like, I mean, the Pharisee. I'm glad I'm not like the tax collector. You can't be like that. It's like, no. Man, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, show me. Show me. Show me. The warning. Number four, his challenge. Follow his challenge. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able, here it is, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There it is, the challenge, though. you got to continue in what you know to be true. I mean, does anybody know when they're going to go to heaven? Anybody know when the rapture is? Anybody know when they're going to die? No. How long could it be? It could be a long time. Before you or I see Jesus. And you, if you're thinking like I'm thinking, well, I'm going to probably live to be whatever. That's a long ways. I got it. Man, Lord, won't you come right now? Make it so much easier for us. No. You got to continue what you know to be true. And he says, number one, you learned the truth and you were convinced, Tim. 
You knew the truth. You know the truth, Tim. Number two, you know who taught you. You know, Tim, you know me. I was your mentor. And Tim, you know the word from your youth, it says. It brought salvation to you. And you must continue as an imperative. And there's like 29 imperatives in the book of 2 Timothy that Paul tells Tim. Tim, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do this. You got to do this. Imperatives. There's no, no fudging on you. You can't play. This is the real deal here. You must be, you must continue and not be fooled by the latest revelations, Tim, that are coming from the false teachers or the latest experience, the newest experience, these false teachers. Remember, Tim was there. He was, he was hearing this stuff. He was the pastor at Ephesus, according to what the Bible says here. And, and in a letter, Paul is calling Tim to him there in prison in Rome. He sends Tychicus with this letter to Tim. Get to me as quick as you can. But the problem was Tim. He was, the, he was trying to pastor all these pastors and, and keep the truth and keep the false. But he was being affected himself. Don't be fooled. You, I, don't be fooled by the latest, the greatest deal that's out there. And there's all kinds of stuff that are continue to come down the pike. There'll always be something new in the emergent church, the, the biggest thing that we got to deal with. And it's, it's, you know, there's no absolutes anymore in the Bible. Well, you know, it's not quite sure about the Bible anymore. And remember, you remember heard about those, uh, those prayer labyrinths? Anybody remember that? It's about 10 years ago that was like big. Oh, they'd set up these, these labyrinths when you just go through. And they weren't like a maze. I mean, you, you directly went through. But they had these little prayer stations. You'd stop here and you'd stop here. And, and the whole idea is the further you went, it's like the deeper you got in and the closer you got to Jesus. It was all, it was all about the experience. And that's what a lot of the emergent church is. It's about the experience. You know, we're going we're gonna to have communion up here and, and we're going to have, but we're going to have the incense as well and, and well, the communion has got to be real wine because, I mean, you've got to experience what they were doing then. And, I mean, all these crazy things, it, just, it all becomes an experience. It's not the truth of God's word. There's nothing wrong with experiencing Christ and experiencing his fullness and the filling of the spirit and just all that. But it's not, that's not what we're seeking. Who are we seeking tonight? Jesus, him and him alone. There's always going to be something new. So the challenge, continue in what you know to be true, Calvary Chapel, South Bay. The last, number five, the man to follow his creed, verse 16, 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the creed, of course, is a set of beliefs that guide a person. We know we have the, the Apostles' Creed and such. But here we see that Paul, he believed in and he lived by the Word. He was like the ultimate man of the Word. And Tim, you know the Word, you know the truth, you got to continue in. And Paul tells him why. Why the Word of God, Tim? Because it's from God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What you hold in your hand tonight, yes, it was written by humans. But humans that were inspired by who? This is God's word, folks. Can never forget that. This, and it's holy. It's kind of like almost scary to carry. It's like, not like that, but it's just, I mean, it's awesome. This is the word of God. This is the spirit of God speaking to men, directing men to write this book, this love letter to me, to you, to guide us, to direct us. What's it good for? He says right here, is given an inspiration of God profitable for what? For doctrine. It's going to teach you the truth. The right things are in God's word. Never close up this book. Never go to a church that says, you don't need to bring your Bible. We'll throw some scriptures up for you, but you can leave it at home. Run. I had a lady tell me that she was going to church. It was kind of like that. And she walks in to the church with one of these. And she, says, she said that some people in the church actually said, are you one of those Calvary people? I kid you not. <laughs> Love it. Are you one of those Calvary people? Doctrine, reproof. It's going to show you 
your sin. It's going to show me my sin. Well, I don't have any sin. You're a liar. Your Bible says so. Am I right? What book? First John, come on. You stumbled me right there. Come home, folks. <laughs> Golly. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. It's going to show your sin for correction. It's going to keep me on the right path. Why do I need to be in God's word every day? Because I'll get off the right path. I mean, we're all sinners. We're all knuckleheads. We're all prone to wander. We're sheep. Sheep are, will go any dumb way. And the devil will call you any dumb way too. No, no, get back. Get back. Get back. Instruction in righteousness. It's going to show me how to walk like Jesus. Plain and simple. Right living. And it'll make me complete, perfect, thoroughly equipped. It's going to prepare me for his service. It's going to prepare me for all the things I need to do for his kingdom. And ultimately preparing me for where? For the, the thing up in the sky, for heaven. See, he's telling Tim, nothing else is needed in your life outside of the word of God. Right here, folks. Don't let any other written material elevate itself above God's word. Can't do it. And yet, this whole psychologizing of the faith. Bible's good, but you need to read this book. Bible's good, but you need to listen to this guy fill you up with trash. Some of you are quick out there. Others, you're just, phew, that went right over your head. Phew, right over, bam. The word, you got to know it. You got to believe it. You got to obey it. Do you know the word of God? Do you know it? And how do you get to know it? You had to read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it daily. It's your daily bread. It's your manna. It's everything for your life. Know it. Believe it. Believe what it says. And then, of course, you got to obey it. We know this. The Word of God is our creed, folks. And the Word is the greatest weapon we have. Because Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, Around verse 17, and take up what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, the Word of God. So the man to reject and the man to follow. Are you rejecting that man? Are you rejecting, rejecting the flesh? And are you following this man? Are you following the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? See, in the last days, these perilous times we're living in, what you do with this is going to determine a whole lot about how easily you or I are deceived and to fall into the traps that the devil wants us to fall. We know that there's a great falling away, the apostasy that speaks of, and of course that really is speaking of the time of the tribulation. But even now, we know. And, and you probably know people that you knew that were believers that aren't around anymore. What happened to them? Where did they go? Why did they fall away? How did they get sucked back into the things of the flesh, the man they were to reject? Right here. You get out of the word. It's been said, this, word, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And so tonight, we're going to pray. The guys are going to come up. Uh, maybe you need to kind of do some business. You, you found that you're following more of the man that we're to reject than you are the man that we're to follow. The example of the Apostle Paul. And you need to fix that. And these guys will be up here to pray with you. Maybe you don't know the Lord. You're not even saved. You, you've never even come to the knowledge of the salvation of Jesus Christ that the Scriptures have to offer, the gospel. These guys would love to pray for you up here as well. But for the rest of us, what you hold in your hand is really the best way, the only way to keep us walking on this right path, following this example, and, uh, and waiting for the trumpet, waiting for that day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. 
Thank you, Lord, that this is a church that loves your word, that teaches your word, that lives by your word. Thank you that this is a people that does the same. And I pray, Lord, that you would continually remind us and encourage us, Lord, the things of the flesh, um, the things of that man to reject, Lord, that uh, God, but for the grace of God, <laughs> we would head that way. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you for the truth in your word. We thank you for the way it corrects us and keeps us. I pray, Lord, that you would give us an even greater desire to live godly in these last days, no matter what, no matter what it's going to cost. That, Lord, we would be those examples. And, Lord, tonight, if there's any here um, who have strayed, who have been convicted by your word tonight, Lord, which is a good thing, pray that they would know that, Lord, there is forgiveness. There's um, just the grace that will set them free tonight. And, Lord, I pray for any here tonight who don't know you, who've never come to know uh, this, this loving Savior. God, would you open up their hearts? Lord, would, would they hear your voice? Would they believe and receive and desire to, uh, to live for you? Father, for those who maybe um, need to rededicate their lives, Lord, so cool, God, that we can always come back to you. When you speak, Lord, and, you, and, you, and we turn to you. So God, minister, we pray, continue to bless this congregation, Lord. Help us to continue walking in your ways. And Lord, let us be a lighthouse in these last days. Bless we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's all stand.